Well, it's great to be with you again this morning, and uh, I trust that you uh, had a good night's rest. Uh, welcome to those who have uh, come over for the first time uh, this morning, and it's really good to uh, uh, get to know some of you. In fact, I had completely lost track of time last night, and I was chatting to Peter and Peter around uh, uh, yeah. over there, wonderful, and uh, I said, after we just sort of pray briefly for one another, I looked at the watch and I looked at the phone, and it was uh, past midnight, so, uh, and uh, the adrenaline was running last night, so it took me quite a while to get to sleep, but uh, it probably took me a while to get up in the morning, so, uh, that's the way it goes sometimes, but it is really great to be with you, and, uh, and welcome again. Well, just to remind you of the chocolate fudge cake uh, illustration from uh, last night, and uh, just the fact that God has got more for us than we've already experienced, and just to hold on to that, certainly. And um, today we're continuing the theme of um, expecting great things from God. So William Carey's life motto, expect great things from God, attend great things for God. Um, and uh, this morning, in both sessions, we're looking at expecting great things from God, which is why it's in the one up there. And um, Ephesians 3 verse 20 tells us that God is able to do far more than we can ask imagine. And if that is true, and we believe the Bible is true, then we must be able to expect more things from God. If he's able to do more than we can imagine, then we've always got to be able to expect for more from God. And that is really important. Who here thinks that we have got a great God who's all powerful, who is omnipotent? Just put up your hand if you think that. Now we believe in a God who answers prayer. There would be absolutely no point in prayer if we didn't believe that God hears and answers prayer. We believe in a God because he's revealed in the Bible and it tells us so that by whom nothing is difficult. <coughs> and therefore we can bring whatever our prayers and requests are to him. And if we have a God who is great, who is powerful, who is answers prayer, for whom nothing is too difficult, can't we expect more from God? Can't we expect great things from God? And I believe we can. William Carey, the great Baptist missionary pioneer to India, certainly believed we could expect great things. And this life motto of his reflects that. And he was determined to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Many people, as I said last night, tried to ridicule him, tried to discourage him from going to India. He suffered deprivation, he po suffered poverty, he suffered opposition, he suffered tragedy in his life, several of his children died. Um, but he determined to expect great things from God. And he achieved, with God's help, what was thought totally and utterly impossible. And so, what are your expectations of God? Just think about that. Do you have any expectations of God? Or do you just sort of let life go by? Have you reduced God to a religious ritual of church attendance and occasional good works and working hard maybe in the church, but it's just about going to church. You know, God continually calls us back to have faith in him and to build on that faith. So just to start us off, I, I think I've still got some bribery and corruption. Let's just um, have a felt for a moment uh, right at the beginning. Oh. I'm going to need someone's help again. Uh, it's all no good at writing on flip charts. Just right at the beginning, what are your expectations of God? Who, who can help us? Uh, Paul, do you want to come through the pod or, or one of the sons or whatever? Um, it helps if you're able to write. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what expectations do you have of God? 
Then because we should all have expectations of God. There's no point in being a Christian if you haven't got any expectations of God. What expectations? Stick your hand and let's have some suggestions. Love and forgiveness. Love and forgiveness. Mm-hmm. How important that we expect, because we know this is revealed in the Bible, that God loves us. And the amazing truth of forgiveness, that Jesus died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. And so they're not just theories out there, we can experience that. Brilliant, wonderful. And come on, there's, there's, you know, our God's great. Lots of work of sanctification in us. Wow, wow. <laughs> you can come up here and preach and explain. <laughs> okay, stick sanctification down there. Making us more like God. Making us more like God. You know, that we become conformed to the image of the Son of God, Jesus. Sanctification and all that is involved in that. Come on, some other, other, other things. Don't worry. That, don't worry if you think of it's not that sensible. Uh, more provider. Jehovah provider. Jehovah Jireh. The names of God. Just think about the names of God. Jehovah Jireh. My provider. Challenge. Uh, challenge. Challenge. Yeah. So challenge or conviction. Yeah. Um, Stuart at the back. Continues to save. Continues to save. Continues to save. <laughs> yeah. Saving the lost. Comforter in trials and storms. Comforter in trials and storms. Isn't that incredible? To know that, you know, within a couple of weeks' time, three weeks' time, whatever, we'll be celebrating Jesus Emmanuel, God with us mm-hmm. in the storm. Lead us in paths that will um, lead us up to this. Yeah, so he leads us in, he leads and guides us. Guidance and is so important, isn't it? Because we need to know God's guidance. We want to be in line with God's will, and that that guidance leads us in ways of service. To take you safely home to heaven. Yeah, bring us safely home to heaven. Oh, praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? That He holds on to us even when we're not holding on to Him. And uh, just to know that constancy. In, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's all about glorifying him. He presents us with opportunities not to make ourselves look great, but to glorify him, to bring him glory. It's all for his glory. Not about us, it's about you, Lord. Some great things there. Some great things. So, sorry, I forgot the bribery and corruption, didn't I? That's, uh, that's a bit of happen, isn't it? <laughs> I've got something. I've got something in here. If you answer the question, then grab a sweet. Let's see if we can do that. Right. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Paul. That's great. Psalm thirty-four, verse eight. Let's see if I can work this. Says, "Taste and see that the Lord is good." That is a wonderful invitation. Have you ever thought about that? That's an invitation to each one of us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The omniscient, the omnipresent, the the omnipotent, all-powerful God invites us to taste him. He invites us to try him out. That's what taste means. To try him out. To taste is to, to come and experience for ourselves. And God this morning invites us to come and experience and to discover his goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Who here knows the Lord is good? Just stick up your hand. That's people. You know the Lord is good. How do you know? How do you know? You know, you can only say... God is good if you've tried him out. If you've experienced his goodness. Otherwise they're just words. They're just words on the page. It's an invitation from God, but you can only know he's good if you've experienced him. If you've uh, had, you've tried him out. 
quite a funny story really, but our eldest grandson is Josiah, he's eight years old now. And uh, his mum and dad, as with many uh, first time parents, had got great aspirations in terms of diet for uh, their children. And so they thought, well, we'll bring them up and we'll feed them good, healthy food. And so they decided that they wouldn't give Josiah any sweets or chocolate or anything else like that while he was, you know, little. And that, you know, they have a healthy diet. So that's what he, he grew up with. And uh, when, he got, when he got about two and a half, they thought, well, I suppose we really ought to introduce him to chocolate. He'd never had chocolate. And they had a bar of Cadbury's dairy milk. He wouldn't have anything else, would you? <laughs> Making you feel hungry again this morning. And they offered him a piece of the dairy milk chocolate, and he turned his nose up in. And you can see what he was thinking. He was thinking, why on earth would I want to put in my mouth that something that's flat, that's brown, that's boring, and it looks as though it belongs down the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, there's no way, no way he was going to put that in his mouth. You know, why eat that, this flat, brown, boring food, and I can have a, a juicy orange carrot. You know, that's what I want. I want a juicy orange carrot. And he just wouldn't taste it. He wouldn't try it. But eventually, of course, they did manage to get him to taste it. And of course, as soon as he tasted it, oh, wow, wow, this is fantastic. This is wonderful. You know, and he wanted more. And you know, we could be like that, can't we? Did that wonderful invitation, taste and see that the Lord is good. And sometimes, you know, we fail to taste. And we're not aware of just how good he is. And the only way that we can know God is good is by tasting him. By trying him out for ourselves. By experiencing his goodness, his love, his mercy, Lots of the things we've got up there, his grace, his amazing grace, his goodness. And so my question to you this morning is, have you ever tried God? Now there be some people here, and you've never actually really tried God. Have you ever really tasted and discovered that God is good? It's so important that we do. And it's a wonderful experience. To experience his goodness. You know, as a, a good strict Baptist boy, I went to so many chapel services. Oh my goodness, they were so boring. <laughs> it was untrue. <laughs> and the prayers went on for about 20 minutes, and the sermons went on for even longer. And uh, I, I've got a real problem nowadays because, well, I've always had a real problem because I can switch off. I can really switch off. And I, I got to the point that it was a pine panel chapel that I was brought up, and I actually started counting the boards on the, on the roof. I, I had trained myself to go to chapel and try and think about anything else other than where I was. You know, I'd imagine I was driving cars along the edge the, where the hymn rack was, you know, and, and all manner of things. I'd turn the hymn books and there was a ramp up there and I'd get them jumping over in my mind, because of course we weren't allowed to take toys, but you know. Um, you know so I can, I can switch off in any situation, as easy as anything. Um, I trained my mind to do it. But I sat through so many sermons, I had to read the Bible, and of course it was the authorised version only, with all of these and wits and this and thus and, and everything else, and I didn't really understand it. And, um, uh, you know, I, but I was still a good strict Baptist boy. You know, I, my uh, grandfather was uh, the vice president of the Trinitarian Bible Society, and he used to um, do these Bible meetings, and I used to, as a, a young boy, I used to go with him, he used to take me with him, and I used to do the bookstore, selling Bibles <coughs> after, the, after the service, and uh, I'd be there, and I'd look the bit, and I had the suit on, and the black tie, or whatever you have to wear in this, that in, environment, and uh, everyone would have thought that I was a Christian, I knew quite a lot of it in my head. I looked as though I was a real Christian. My parents at that stage, probably about the only stage, they were probably quite proud of me uh, in that sense. But I have never, ever tasted that the Lord is good. I've never actually tried God out. I've never asked God into my life. 
I had no experience of God in my life. And I was not a genuine Christian at all. It's just that I've been brought up in that environment. See, growing up in chapel or in church doesn't make you a Christian. Growing up with a mum and dad who go to chapel or church doesn't make you a Christian. You actually need to taste and see for yourself that the Lord is good. It's no good telling my grandson that chocolate's wonderful. He needs to experience it for himself. Yes, I've experienced it, and I knew that that would transform my taste buds. But until he actually took it and tasted it for himself, he wouldn't have known that. And so we have to experience God in our life to understand that he is good. And we need, in that sense, to ask God into our lives, to be born again by his Spirit. And I just encourage you, if there's anyone here, maybe young people here today, if you've never asked God into your life, do it this weekend. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't just rely on mum or dad telling you that the Lord is good. Taste and see for yourself, because he's got wonderful stuff just for you. And that's so precious and that's so important. And... um, it, that those things are so important. God says, don't just know about me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience the reality of God's goodness for yourself. And as we invite God into our lives, we discover the, all that he has for us. We discover the reality and the power of God. But I guess most of us, because most of us put up our hands here today, I guess most of us have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We've become Christians. We've been born again. But perhaps we haven't gone much further. We've tasted, but we've never feasted on God. We've taken a slice of the triple layer chocolate fudge cake, but we've never gone back to God for more. And you know, God wants us to expect greater things from him, to go back to him for more. Because however long you have been a Christian, God has got far more for you than you've already experienced. I guess most of you, or most of us, would love to know God and Jesus like the Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul knew God so well. He had such a living relationship with Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And... uh, uh, amazing things, he'd experienced amazing things. Of course, we love reading uh, his writings. But Philippians 3, Paul says, I want to know more. <clears throat> now, I guess if, if any of us had the same sort of relationship with God that the Apostle Paul was saying, we've arrived, you know, this is great. The Apostle Paul said, Now, all those things, all the depth of the theology and the knowledge the Apostle Paul had, and yet he said, I want to know. I want to know Christ. I want to know God better. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conform to his death. That's what uh, Philippians 3, verse 10 says. If the Apostle Paul said, I want to know God better, then none of us as Christians would say, I don't want to know God better. I know everything, because none of us will ever know. And if Paul had that hunger, theologian and and wonderful Christian as he was, to know Christ better, then that should be our hunger. That should be our desire. We cannot be complacent about these, these things. So he prays that I may know him. That I may know him. Do you want to know Jesus better than you do? I do. I want to know Jesus better than I do. And I've been a Christian for 43 years. I guess Jeff over there, who was uh, telling me he's uh, uh, not far off an optical layer in or whatever. Um, <laughs> you, still, you still want more of Jesus? Uh, yeah. yeah, we all want more of Jesus. We want to know Jesus better. And so again, I encourage you to be hungry for more of God this weekend, to expect great things. And 
I want to encourage us not just to taste and see that the Lord is good, but to go on and feast on him so that we may be growing in knowing him, so that our friends, so our neighbours, so our workmates, so our colleagues will see the reality and the power of God at work in our lives, because that is what brings glory to Jesus, and we've got it there on the books. The problem for some of us is that we have been trying to survive on a starvation diet. Physically, we may be too fat, and... Uh, not very healthy and need a diet. But spiritually, we can be like the starving children that we see on television and they're moved by their plight and their pot bellies. And you know, physically, we may be very well fed, but spiritually, sometimes as Christians, we can try and survive on a starvation diet and it affects and damages our lives. God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to feed on him that we may be growing and healthy as Christians. We can expect great things of God because he invites us not just to taste and see that he's good, but he invites us to feast on him. In the Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Solomon it, the Bible speaks about God's banqueting table that he has prepared for those who love him. God's banqueting table. <clears throat> now I guess most of us like food. Some of you look as though you like food or not. <laughs> <laughs> the evidence is there. <laughs> How, but you know, God invites us to a feast. Feasting is one, isn't it? Feasting is far better than the past. Mm. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he invites us to fast, uh, to feast, not fast. <laughs> he invites us to fast as well. But uh, and God has prepared this banqueting table for those who love him. And it's there again in Psalm 23. A table he has prepared for us in the presence of his enemies. And perhaps you've never thought about this. You know, when we look at Psalm 23, we always think of the Lord as our shepherd and walking through the valley in the shadow of death, etc. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we sometimes miss this little bit. A table he has prepared for us in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. A picture there is of a feast. And God has prepared a feast. It's a feast for us. And he invites us to come and feast on what he has provided. So he's provided the banqueting table. You prepare, God has prepared a table for me, a banqueting table. He invites us to come and feast there. And it's laden down with all of the most beautiful foods, all the most wonderful foods you can imagine. And he says, you're invited to come and eat that. And all the time around you, God's enemies are actually having to watch you eat it. And they're starving. It's, it's quite a powerful picture. But you know, God has prepared a banqueting table for us. A, a, a table where we can feast on him. And God, it's amazing because God invites you and me, sinful me, sinful you, to come and feast. Not just to taste, but to feast. To feed on what he's prepared for us. What a privilege, what an honour. And the question is, is, will you come and feast, or will you refuse? Well, it's a terribly sad thing to refuse what God offers us. At uh, Rock Christian Centre, as I was, saying, I was saying last night, we're a very multicultural church, and one of the best events that we do is an international feast. It is a fantastic <coughs> occasion, because there's nothing like the real food cooked by the real people mm. from those countries. And uh, there's tables and tables, and we encourage everyone to come in their national costume, and we have the most wonderful costumes come out, and then people bring their entertainment, their worship, whatever it may have to be, songs, dance sometimes, from all manner of places, all manner of nations right across the world, and they love it because they're celebrating their culture, they're singing the songs in their own languages, and, and it's just fantastic. But the food is absolutely incredible. 
And uh, we used to do this in our, in our old church down in London as well, because that was very multicultural as well. And, um, but my second daughter, Bethany, when she was a teenager, was really fussy about food. And uh, so she, there would be all these wonderful foods all labelled up. Some of them weren't quite so wonderful when they were all tried and stuff like that. But, you know, <laughs> most of it was absolutely incredible. Red snapper from the Seychelles and, oh, you know, Afro-Caribbean food and lots of different African nations and Kashima and oh, a lot of different things. Wonderful stuff. And the daughter would be sitting there in a the corner with some crisps <laughs> and a sandwich. She wouldn't try any of these foods. She didn't think she would like them. And so she missed out on all these things. Now, she's now 13 and uh, 34 and a, a mum herself, and, and she loves uh, foreign food now, but she didn't at that stage. And she missed out on all the delights. And you know, sometimes we'd be like that as a Christian. You know, we can be looking at God's table, but we're just comfortable with what, what we're familiar with. We're just comfortable with what we're familiar with. We'll, we'll just sit, sit with the crisps and the sandwiches because we know what we're dealing with. You know, God has got so much more for us. And he invites us to come and feast on him. And so I say, are you missing out on what God wants to give you? Because we can expect greater things from God. God's banqueting table is laden down with vast quantities of the best spiritual food you can imagine. Every different type. God invites us to come and feast on, on God the Father. On God the Son, Jesus Christ. On God the Holy Spirit. He invites us to feast on the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, knowledge, self-control. He invites us to come and feast on the, on the gifts of the Spirit, the Father love of God, and so much more he invites us to come and feast on. Now some of us may have taken a look at the, some of the foods on God's banqueting table and said, I don't like the look of that. I don't want that. No, I, I want more God, but I, I don't want to be like that other Christian. Like that. I think I'll give that a miss. And we end up turning up our noses at something that God wants us to feed on. It may be the work, it may be the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, no, I'm not sure about that. That's not for me. And that is how I felt <clears throat> for many years myself. But can I encourage you? There are no bad foods on God's banqueting table. Not one single food on God's banqueting table that will harm you. You can Open yourself up to receive more of God, and God will never harm you. He'll never give you something that will hurt or harm or damage you. If you've been around farming for a while, you will have all heard of mad cow disease. Can I assure you that if you're feasting on God's banqueting table, you won't catch mad Christian disease? <laughs> now, a lot of us are scared. I think, if I open myself up to more God, if I'm hungry for more God, am I going to turn out like a, you know, one of those loony Christians, you know, that, that do wild and stupid things? Can I say, if you're feasting on God, no. He will give you what is right for you. He's got food specially prepared. He's got your name on it. And you can come and feast on him without worrying that you're going to become a mad Christian. I remember for years, uh, uh, Stuart will know him, uh, Paul Sands, <laughs> and uh, Paul's a, a Northern Irish, raving, uh, mad Northern Irish Ulster man. And uh, I used to go to meetings with, with Paul, and I thought, oh, it's just so embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassing going with him to meetings. Praise the Lord. You know, he was like a I suppose a charismatic in place of that. It was ridiculous. Uh, it, it was just no tact whatsoever. And um, he knows all this, so he, he knows this. And I told him, I, I was saying to the Lord, well, I want more of you, but I don't want to be like Paul Sainz. <laughs> and, you know, but there was a fear there for me 
And if I open myself up to God, what's going to happen? Am I going to lose control? Well, praise God, yes. <laughs> because we're never meant to be in control in the first place. It's meant to be God who's in control, not us. And the trouble is, is we get scared of opening ourselves up to other things. And that beautiful passage that was read to us, Luke 11, 9 to 13. I think I'll put it up here. Jesus tells us that our loving Father God is a giving God. The last thing you will see is not that the door will be open to you. Seek and you will find. Of course, it's in the continuous tense in the Greek. So it's keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's not an instant thing. But this beautiful passage <coughs> that he delights to give us good things. If you then, though you are evil, sorry folks, that's what we are. Jesus is speaking. No, by nature, we're evil. But if you, as you are as human beings, simple human beings, know how to give good gifts to your children, and know we're, half of you have probably already bought you, Christmas gifts. And you know, it's a, a joy, isn't it, to buy things for the children or the grandchildren or whatever. We know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He delights, God delights to pour out his Holy Spirit. He delights to give us good things. I don't are there any Scottish people here today? <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. You know, many of us, particularly if we've been brought up in similar circles to myself, have the idea that God is some sort of stingy Scotsman sitting up in heaven. <laughs> now, with his arms folded and a very cross expression on his face. No, I, I was brought up under the fear of God. You know, every time there was a thunderstorm when I was a kid, I thought, no, this is God's judgment coming in, etc. You know, and, ah, fine, my goodness. But you know, we, we, we have this idea that God's sitting up there in heaven, and he's got a cross expression on his face, and his arms are folded, and you ask and you ask, and, and it, you know, eventually, because you keep on asking, and you keep on praying, and you keep on asking for this thing, you think, I'm going to have to give this. I'm like, to these people. I don't really want to, but you know, I'm going to have to do something for them because they keep on asking. Completely the wrong picture. But God, what God is. Many of us feel we can't even ask God for things because He's so holy and so great and so mighty, and we're so sinful and we don't deserve anything. Of course, we don't deserve anything. We never deserve to get saved in the first place. We're all sinners. We deserve absolutely nothing. But God, in His amazing grace and mercy, delights to give good gifts to His children. <laughs> Incredible. It's absolutely amazing. We deserve nothing. I deserve nothing. And yet He delights to pour out. He delights to give good gifts to His children. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's even more beautiful because He lavishes His love upon us. He's not a meagre God. Just look at 1 John 3, 1. <coughs> no, that's wrong one. Was it up there before? Go back, yeah. Yeah, how great. Just, just think about that. Just meditate just for a moment on this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. That should bring a few smiles to our faces. We, this morning in the prayer meeting, Paul was leading us and encouraging us to be more joyful and to experience the joy of the Lord. You know, if you really understand that text, it's very hard to be a sad Christian. You know, because if we really grasp that God has lavished his love upon us, that's life changing. It's transformational to our faces. Well, I'm a Christian. Would <laughs> <laughs> you like to become a Christian? No, thank you very much. <laughs> no. Would you like to come along to our church? <laughs> I'd come along to the church. And it's all very boring. <laughs> no, if we really 
really grasp what God's done for us, we should be excited. We shouldn't be able to contain it within us. We should be sharing that with everyone, shouldn't we? Because we're on fire for God, because God has lavished his love completely undeserved, but he lavishes his love uh, upon us. You know, it's wonderful, isn't it, when someone lavishes. And perhaps none of us have experienced very much of that. But, you know, it's a wonderful thing. It's, great, it's a great secret to marriage. I'm afraid I'm a big failure at it. But, you know, if you lavish your love on your, on your wife or husband, if you're married, then you're going to find the love coming back very quickly, particularly when it's sacrificial love, agape love. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. God is the giving. He's a generous God. The question is, is how hungry are we for all that he has for us? 1 Peter 1. We'll get to that uh, next one. 1 Peter 2, sorry, verse 2 to 3 says, Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk that so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Peter is saying, if you have tasted that the Lord is good, he actually uses those same words. Don't stop there. He said, crave more, be hungry for more. Um, and Peter uses graphic language. He says, be like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. Now, if you've ever had a newborn baby, you know what he means. Because you try and pacify a baby who wants to be fed. You can, you can muck them down on your knee, you can coo at them, you can do whatever you like, you can move them around and everything else. But, but they're never going to be pacified, are they? They're never going to be pacified until they get the milk. And what, what will happen? All the time, their mouth is going because they just want to latch on or bottle of grass or whatever it may happen to be, they are, the only thing that's going to satisfy them is the milk. And, and Peter's in here and saying, be like that with God. You know, don't allow anything else to satisfy you. you know, money and possessions and everything else will never satisfy you. Be like, you said, be like newborn babies. Crave pure spiritual milk. <coughs> The sole interest of a baby is its milk. Its mouth is ready and waiting. And Peter said, be like that with God. And he uses that really strong word, crave. It means to long for, to desperately desire. And it's the same word found in Psalm 42, which you will know. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants, so my soul craves, so my soul desires desperately, craves for you, O oh my God. My soul craves and thirsts for the living God. So in summary, the New Testament leaves no excuse for complacent Christians who have no hunger for more of God. It's all there in the Bible. We can expect great things from God because he is the great giver. He invites us to taste and to see that the Lord is good, but to go on to feast at the banqueting table he has prepared for us. Not to reject any of the wonderful blessings and gifts that God has prepared for those who love him. God wants us to discover more of him, to go deeper in to him so that we can go further out for him. That's another way of expect great things from God and attempt great things for God is to say to go deeper in to him so that we can go further out for him. How hungry and thirsty are you for God? Will you come back to God? Will you go back to God for more? this weekend. Just as I close, let's just um, let's just close our eyes just for a few moments. And let's just reflect. Yes, reflect on what I've been saying, but much more reflect on what God has been saying to you through what I've been saying. 
I'll just encourage you. If you want more from God today, just open your hands in front of you. You know, this Christmas, when someone gives you a gift, you're not going to have folded hands saying, I don't want to receive that gift. You're going to have open hands to receive <coughs> that present, that gift. And so just be open before the Lord. He is the sovereign almighty God. Lord, help us to receive from you. Just allow God just to minister. us by your spirit Lord. Lord that we would experience more of you Lord help us to come to your <coughs> and to feast on you Lord would you go deeper into my life so that I can go further out for you Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit Lord, upon us, Lord. <coughs> Lord, move upon us, Lord, in us. Lord, we thank you. to give good gifts to his children. Lord, would you come? Lord, would you refresh and renew and just impart your wonderful grace-filled blessings upon each of us, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, for our just <coughs> Is if anyone would like a prayer <coughs> more than the Spirit, just to experience more of God, then um, when, the, when the session ends, don't bash your way for, for coffee. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll stay at the front here, and if you just like prayer, then uh, do feel free. Don't be embarrassed. Not because I'm anyone special, but because. God delights to give good gifts and good things to his children and we can receive from him and uh, remember that you won't catch mad Christian disease <laughs> but we can experience more of God